It's interesting that I have been extra tempted this week. Okay? <laughs> Maybe that's not, yeah, Eric, no, wait, we don't get tempted. Okay, you're lying, first of all. Second of all, I, I, was, I was tempted this week. Now, you, you might not know what is in here. Some of you do. All of you are about to find out, but not, not fully, okay, because I'm not going to give in to temptation, okay? So, so um, this last week, we were blessed in, in Awana, uh, the pastors on staff, uh, were, were invited down, and we were given gifts, we were given cards, but possibly, I'm not, I'm not trying to slight anything that your children may have given us, but possibly the greatest gift we were given in that, in that time downstairs, um, Susan Rivers made homemade cookies for us. Now listen, these are not mine. I ate mine. Amen. Okay? They were gone within just not long, 24 hours or less. They were gone. There were five or so in here, uh, in, well, in there, <laughs> in mine. Now, so, so here's where the temptation part comes in. Not that I gave in to eat things that I didn't necessarily need. I, I gave in to that. Okay? But <laughs> here, here's where, t- for me, the real temptation came in. I came into the office. That was Wednesday night. I came into the office Thursday morning, and one of the first things I do often when I come into the office is I'll check my mailbox. There may be something in there that's important, or there may be some things in there I just need to file, and you know what I'm talking about, okay? Well, as I looked in my mailbox, very near my mailbox in our, in our, in our office area, there are other people's mailboxes. One of those other people just happened to be out of town last week. Now, he came back in. He's here today. He has given me permission to use this to explain to you what, what we're doing today as a sermon illustration. Now, I came in Thursday. Uh, I, I did some work at Panera. Alex and I um, uh, met uh, for lunch uh, up there, kind of a, a late lunch. After that, I came into the office, um, and I looked in the mailroom. And I noticed this bag looked exactly like the bag that I had received the night before. And I thought, hmm, who else got some of these wonderful cookies? Now listen, I don't know what she puts in here, but I'm pretty sure this is what the manna from heaven was supposed to be. Okay, it's sustaining, it's good, this, this, but it's probably not that because... Because no one would have ever gotten tired of this and started complaining, okay? I'm just telling you right now, no one would have ever, that would never have been a temptation, okay? Here's what the temptation was. I looked, and, and on here, is, there's a little kind of harvesty bag, like a fall-colored bag. There's a bag inside here. I'm not going to open it up because this person told me, uh, you can use it for an illustration, but don't put your fingers on my cookies, okay? Um, on the thing, it says, Dear Pastor Lionel. And then lots of nice things that, whatever. Anyway, I didn't care about that. I cared about the cookies. And here's, here's where my mind went. I'm not, my, my mind went, he's out of town. He'll never know. I'm not going to tell him. He's, okay, secondly, he's out of town. He won't see these until Sunday at the earliest. They're going to dry out. They're not going to taste as good by then. He may not even wind up eating them. So, so I probably, and I was legit tempted to take these suckers. I, because here, listen, I had seen what they looked like before when I opened mine up. And they looked good. Okay? I had tasted what they tasted like. And they tasted really good. And on top of that, I'm the pastor. Right? So like... Unless the elders get mad about it, I'm not getting fired, right? So, so I'm thinking, like, they'll, they'll never find out. No one will. And for, like, a split second, I thought, I could take those. But I didn't. I resisted the urge. I resisted temptation. And in light of that, Julie, I don't want to throw these because they'll break. Can you just hold those for, for me? Because I don't, I don't need to have that temptation up here long, okay? So now... If, if you're like me, there are things in your life that are tempting to you. We are tempted to sin. The Bible says that temptation leads to sin, and sin leads to death. So I'm kind of making light of this whole temptation thing, but it's a big deal. 
What was I tempted to do? I was tempted because I was tempted with a few things and I was tempted to justify it in certain ways. And it is really interesting that all sin can be dealt with in that way. All sin can be experienced in that way. All temptation can be experienced in that way. It looks good. I bet it tastes good. And you know what? I'm important enough that it's not a big deal if I do this. We'll get into that text in a minute that describes some of those things. I was tempted to go, you know what? Like, uh, I know that this isn't mine, but no one will know. No one will, no one will know. I can get away with this. And all temptation looks and feels like that at the, at the very beginning. Here's what I want to tell you as we get into Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Um, what is temptation? When we look in the Bible and we see the word tempt, temptation, what, what, what does that mean? The biblical idea of temptation is not primarily of seduction as we often think about it. It can be that, but it's not always that. It really is a lot more like testing. Like we were given this, this test, and it is a pass-fail, right? Not graded on a curve like we think it might be. It's pass-fail. Did we sin? Did we not sin? Did we give in to the temptation? Did we not give in to the temptation? The, the idea here of this word in the Hebrew, it's not in Hebrew here, but, but it's derived originally, this idea came from this Hebrew idea, and it was a, the word was used, uh, uh, behan, it was used as a metaphor for metal refining. Let me test this metal, let me purify this metal, this process of purifying it, and it's purified by testing it. Now here's what you need to understand. Temptation, when, when we give in to temptation, that's sin, and all sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Randy read it to us earlier. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's amazing news. And as we look at this text today from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, here's the main heart of what I want you to get. Look at me. Here's the main heart of what I want you to get. And this is, I believe, the main message Matthew has for us. We actually can learn some examples of how Jesus interacts here. But here's the main message. Ready? Here's the main message. You and I have given in to sin, but Jesus lived a sinless life. He overcame temptation and sin and death so that we could have life. Okay? Are you out there today? That's actually the best news ever. That's literally the best, literally the best news ever. The best news ever is that even though you and I have sinned against God, the Son of God came and he lived a sinless life on our behalf so that anyone who puts their faith in him can and will have eternal life. That's the message that's trying to get across here. We're going to learn and grow in this process together as we look at this today. The question can be, how can we resist when temptation comes? How can we resist when temptation comes? Jesus' example for us helps us understand that. So let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Are you there? Awesome. Here we go. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Uh, yeah. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands... They will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. 
And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's pray. Father, speak to us from your word today. Help us to understand and believe and apply the truth of your word today that we may live lives pleasing unto you, our Lord, our Master, our Savior. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so how can we become people who can overcome when temptation comes? Jesus sets an example for us here. We're going to look at this really quick. Number one. The first thing we must do is we must remember who we are. Remember who you are. I'm not trying to go all Mufasa on you right now, okay? But remember who you are. Look back one verse before chapter 4. What happens in the verse before chapter 4? Jesus has been baptized. A dove has come down as the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We, Jesus remembered who he is and we as God's people must remember who we are in Christ. Listen, Galatians chapter four, verses four through seven, it's coming on the screen, check this out. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You, when you and I are tempted, the first thing we must do to overcome this temptation is we got to remember who we are now. Now, listen, are you honest enough to, to admit that you're probably like me, that you're growing in holiness, you're growing in Christ-likeness, but some of the things that you did and ways you lived before you knew Jesus, they still sometimes have their tentacles attached to part of your heart and part of your life? When you came to Christ, all those temptations didn't just go away immediately, did they? And some of them will stay until we get to heaven. Some of those temptations will always be temptations. Now leave, be blessed, be encouraged, right? Okay? But, but just because it's a temptation doesn't mean we have to give in to it because that's who we were, not who we are. Not who we are now. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We're his handiwork. We're his masterpiece, his work of art. We are not who we were. We are not yet who we will be. That's why we still battle against this temptation. But we are not who we were. And so if we want to overcome the temptation that so easily comes into our hearts, into our lives, that this flesh really likes, anybody's, anybody's flesh no longer enjoys sin? I mean, the spirit in you doesn't, but doesn't it feel good for a minute? No, no, not us. It's like, don't be afraid to admit. Like, right? I think the fruit in Genesis 3 tasted really good to Eve at first. God made it. Guarantee you it tasted good. So listen, we've got to remember who we are, not just thinking about who we were. Remember who you are. It also says right here, and we'll, we'll get into this here in a minute, but in verse 3 of chapter 4, and the tempter came and said to him, if you're the son of God, da 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 da, da why, did he, why did he do that? Some, this translation uses the word if. A better translation might actually be since. Since you're the son of God, and he's trying to get Jesus to justify sinful behavior like, like we do. Why is that what the why is that the, the temptation that he starts with with Jesus? Because right before that he just got told the everyone could hear. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, well yeah, you're the son of God. Anybody else ever experienced that some of the greatest mountaintops of your faith 
are often quickly followed by stupid, sinful decisions you make. Isn't it crazy? It's like, wow, look at what God did. And then five minutes later, you're like, you've fallen into a sin that like you hadn't struggled with for a long time. I haven't been tempted maybe even with, but you're right in it. And you're just like, oh, why? I think there are a couple of reasons why. One of those reasons why is our guard kind of gets down. We get to this, well, I'll, ne- I'll never sin again, right? Look at what God did. We're on this mountaintop, like, yeah. And then the next thing we know, we're in our, it's like our version of throwing the tablets down, right? You got those 10 commandments, let's just break them all at one time, right? So I think one of the reasons is our guard sometimes gets down. I think one of the other reasons is um, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When the enemy sees God working, he's got, oh, I got to step in here. There's, I, don't, I can't, I can't, I got to fight. I got to fight. I got to resist here. The enemy starts thinking, I've got to resist. I've got to fight because God's doing something. And I can't let this person have too much victory. So I'm, I'm going to attack. I'm going to attack. Now, just because he attacks doesn't mean he gets to win. We're going to look later. He's a defeated foe. Amen? Okay? But the truth is, he will attack. And one of the things he will do is he will Make you doubt who you actually are and try to keep you from remembering who you are. So step one, you want to overcome this temptation. You want to overcome giving in to that sin. Step one is remember who you are. Number two, if we're going to remember who we are, number two, we need to recognize when you are weak. Recognize when you are weak. Look at Matthew chapter four. We'll start in verse one. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Who sent Jesus out? The Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness for what to happen? To be tempted. Sometimes the Spirit of God takes you dangerous places. Don't you ever think that God's will is the easy path? Some of you have been angry with your spouse at some point because he led you somewhere that he knew this is what God wanted, but it didn't go well. And our temptation is to look at that spouse and say, if you had been listening to God, this bad thing never would have happened. Sometimes God leads us into more difficult things. Wife, hear me. Following your husband doesn't mean that God is promising it's going to go well. Maybe God's leading you into something difficult on purpose because he's trying to teach you something that you can only learn in that difficulty. Now, maybe he's being selfish and and whatever, but chances are, if he's led by the Spirit of God, ladies, you follow him and don't tell him, I told you so, if it doesn't go perfectly at first. Because what what if God's will was actually for it to be hard for a while? because you needed that lesson. Now, that's no fun. It's no fun being a husband saying, hey, this, I think this is what God's telling us to do, and then it being harder than it was before. There's already a, a something in us that's going to make us question our decision-making. You don't get duped by the enemy and help us question it. Okay, line it up with the Word of God, but aside from that, Ladies, follow well. Husbands, lead faithfully. Even, especially when it's hard. Especially when it's hard. Look here. So, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Understatement of a, like, a long time. All right? I've never done a 40-day fast. I've done a pretty long fast, but I've never made it to 40 days, okay? Uh, if, you've, if you've never fasted, let me, fasting is, is, is this, okay? It's not like, hey, I'm praying about something and God's not answering, so let me twist his arm by not eating, okay? That's like the, that's like the Christian version of the prophets of Baal cutting themselves, going, listen now, like we really mean it, like, right? Okay? Fasting is you denying yourself something your body needs and desires so that you can focus on spiritual things. And so the idea is every time you feel those hunger pains, no, I'm going to pray. Because fast and pray, they go together. Okay? So it's the idea of I will deny myself something I physically need and want. 
And instead of doing that, I'm going to replace it with prayer and time in the Word. That's the idea of fasting. It more, more of the time, it gets you in line with the heart of God than the heart of God in line with you. Okay? It's not you twisting God's arm. Okay? So, uh, if you want more of that, I think in Isaiah 58, there's some good fasting principles. You can look there later. We don't have time. Okay? Jesus fasts for 40 days. Now, here's what, what we experience when we fast. The first three days are the worst three days of your entire life. If not the worst, they're up there, depending on what has happened in your life, right? The first three days are not fun. It's hunger pains. It's like all this stuff. What happens, though, as you're drinking water, but after about three days, the hunger pains, they go away. Like they're gone. You kind of don't even feel hungry for a while, your stomach has kind of shrunk a little bit, and your body starts using its, uh, the, the things that you have stored up, <laughs> and that's what you're running on, okay? Around, when, when, you, when you fast, you break through that three-day mark, what you experience for a pretty good while is, like, I'm, I'm actually pretty good. I'm pretty good. I, I don't feel super hungry very often. When the hunger pains legit, not like a one-off, but when the hunger pains legit come back, often maybe around 40 days, that is your body saying, okay, eat or die. You're starving to death. That's where Jesus is here. You understand? That's where Jesus is here. He's faint. He's feeling weak. His body is telling him, eat or die. And then the temptation begins. All right? So we must recognize when we are weak. Recognize when we are weak. Look at chapter 4, uh, verse 2 again. He's tempted here. Look at verse 4, verse A, um, letter A here. He says, it is written. Verse 7, at the beginning, it is written. Verse 10, at the beginning, be gone, for it is written. We must recognize when we are weak, but... We must also lean on what real strength is. Recognize when we are weak, lean on what real strength is. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Have you ever seen someone who was thinking of himself or herself in such a way because they were not sober at the moment. They're drunk. That's the point. That's the question. You ever seen a drunk person? They always think they're a little stronger than they actually are. Sometimes they think they're a little bit better fighters than they actually are. Sometimes they think they're more attractive than they actually are. Sometimes, like... Right? Why? Because they're not thinking with sober judgment. This text here in Romans 12, 3, don't think too highly of yourself, think soberly. But I would also say don't think too lowly of yourself. That's pride too. Some of us walk around like pity party, like, oh, woe is me. Oh, this is bad. And you know what that is sometimes? Sometimes that's our way to manipulate other people to feel bad for us so we get attention. Now listen, if you're having a hard time you are allowed to be honest about having a hard time. I want you to be honest about having a hard time. But how about remembering who you are so that we don't have to live there? That makes sense? We need to encourage one another. We need to love one another. We need to build one another up. But we also need, don't need to be the person that, okay, here comes the leech. They're going to try to suck all the, the love out of everybody. Here they come. Before long, what happens is people will start being tempted to avoid you because you never give. You always ask and take. And there's got to be both. There's gotta, it's okay to take when you need, but if, that, if that's the only thing you do, man, that's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard when you have that person like, oh, all they're going to do is complain about how bad things are? Um, I, was, I was talking with someone recently, and, and we had, a, um, it was actually this morning, we had, we had a bunch of miscarriages. Um, and, and a sweet lady from our congregation said, I don't know how you guys ex like, endured that. We had seven. And Julie, God gave Julie and I a friend whose son was in my middle school ministry 
years ago. She's a school teacher. She's, listen, she's awesome. She's like that tall. She's the tiniest little thing, right? Her maiden name was Kid, and I don't think she ever grew out of that. Like, okay, she's, listen, she is wonderful, godly lady. She's not perfect because she's like us, but she's wonderful. And when we were going through this, she quickly came to Julie and just, she just told her, I understand. And Julie's kind of, what do you mean you understand? And, and this lady, she said, I stopped counting after 25. She has two children that are grown. She had miscarriages at the beginning, between them, and after. Actually, for you, beginning, between them, and after. I should have done that that way. You know what that did? That encouraged us not to give up. God gave us that. Sometimes what we need to do is we need to admit and recognize when we are weak, but we got to be careful not to think, like, I'm the only person this is ever, this is Elijah. Like, it's just me. I'm the only one left. (laughs) No, you're not. No, you're not. We must, though, recognize when we are weak. Listen, if you are constantly giving in to a temptation, Take a step back and go, okay, what are the circumstances surrounding when I'm giving into this? Am I alone? Okay, let's figure out a way not to put myself in that situation as easily. Um, Am I with my phone? Am I with this other person or this other group of people? Let's adjust accordingly. Step back and game plan a little bit so that in the future you're not giving in there. Recognize where you are weak and try not to live there. And try to, to buffet those areas in such a way that you're not quite so weak in that moment that, that it keeps you from having the opportunity to give in to that sin. we got to recognize when we are weak. But here's the good news. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and this is what he writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's the good news. When you are weak, God is strong. Let him enter in. Lynn, if you're in the house and temptation's knocking, let Jesus answer. Let him answer. Okay? Okay? So, number one, remember who you are. Number two, recognize where you are weak. Jesus is weak here. Like, he's hungry. Like, it's to the, he's starving to death. That's where he is. Number three, we've got to recognize the wiles of the enemy. Yes, I decided to find a W word. I did, okay? There's lots of W's today, all right? Recognize, this is a King James version for you here, all right? Nothing wrong with that. Recognize the wiles of the enemy. Look at verse number three. And then we're going to look at a couple different places. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, or since you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Look down at verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands... They will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Now look at verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. I would say to you that there are three main appeals that the enemy will tempt us with that our bodies like. Here, Here they are, ready? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. When I saw those cookies, I was like, ooh, those are those cookies. They look good. Those cookies taste good. They'll make my body feel good if I eat them. Not for long, but at first, <laughs> right? I'll pay for it later, right? And third, you know what? It's okay for me to take those because I'm Pastor Eric, course like I I deserve this the lust of the eyes lust of the flesh boastful pride of life and this is how he's not super creative he just knows what works if it ain't broke don't fix it he has thousands of years of human observation to base this upon and we're still falling into it aren't we 
still falling into that temptation. This is how Jesus is tempted. This is how, in the beginning, they were tempted. We'll look at that in just a second. 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that we could not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen, the enemy has plans. He has a game plan. He has schemes. He has designs. He has designed plays to run against you. They're all based on these same things, but he has designed plans to run against God's people. He has. He has a plan, we don't, but we don't need to be ignorant of it. So how do we not be ignorant of it? Well, we look again at the Word of God. Second, uh, 1 John chapter 2. How did I come up with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life? Where did I come up with that? Well, honestly, from Scripture. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse number 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Keep going. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Where else in Scripture do we see that? Well, we see that here in Matthew chapter 4. We see it in Matthew chapter 4. Look at what it says here in verse number 3 again. The tempter came came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be loaves of bread. What would that be? Lust of the flesh. I need this to satisfy me. It'll it'll help my body. Look at verses 5 and 6. And the devil took him to the holy city that set him on the pinnacle and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. We'll come back to this in just a minute. There's a point to be made there. Okay? Verses 8 and 9, we read those, right? Um, and the, uh, so 5 and 6, as we look at that, the temptation there is the pride of life. Hey, you're the Son of God. God said he's going to do this. Do it. I mean, you're important. God won't let this happen to you. You're his special child. You're his favorite. And you know what? Like, it's a little twist, but like, he'll forgive you because you're his favorite. Verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. It looked good. Lust of the eyes. Genesis chapter 3. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 with me. You don't want to miss this. Some of us are giving in to sin and temptation because we are ignorant of his schemes. We don't know how this happened. Like you just like, it's kind of like when you started, you went to YouTube for that one thing to learn how to do, and two hours later you're watching videos of kittens attacking things, right? Like the laser pointer, right? It's like, how did I get here? Some of us, we do that with, with our life, and it's like, how did, how did I get here? Like, I, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't start off here, but now I'm, I'm in this sin. How did I get here? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, the enemy, one of his tactics is, he will question God's word. How many things in our culture today are clearly from Scripture sin, but people want to explain it away. I mean, that's not what God... The word homosexual is not even in the Bible. Like, what are you talking about? That's not in there. Um, It's pretty clear that God's design is one man, one woman for life. That's pretty clear from God's Word. Anything outside of that is is outside of that, is out of bounds. But, oh, did God really say that's the same tactic? Did God really say... Keep going. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, okay, first of all, don't talk to snakes. Okay? Adam, when the snake starts talking, stomp its head. Why are you letting your wife talk to a snake? Okay? Man up, but he doesn't. Potentially here as you look at this, Eve's the first one who ate the fruit. At worst, their sin was simultaneous because what's he being? A passive husband. She'll handle it. And the woman said to the serpent, 
We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. God actually didn't say that. Probably Adam told her, just don't even touch it. <laughs> okay? <coughs> Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Question God's word. Question consequences. Oh, that's not really going to happen. Question the consequences. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Accuse God of holding out on you. So question his word, question the consequences, question his character. If God were good, he wouldn't keep this from you. Here's how we treat sin sometimes. We view sin as if we are in prison the sin is out there, and there are prison walls with barbed wire like around the top keeping us from all, and we look at that, and it's like, all the good stuff's out there, God. Why don't you let me have some good stuff in here? That looks fun. God's word is not prison walls keeping you from something good. The good is not out there. That's death. It just looks good. It's good to the eyes. It looks good. It's not good. That's you trying to satisfy yourself outside the will and design of God. But the enemy comes along and he's like, hey, God didn't really, did God really say that? Nothing bad will happen. No one will know. Um, and, and on top of that, if God really loved you, he would give you this. And he questions the goodness of God. He's holding out on you. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the eyes, it was de- uh, good for food, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the lust of the flesh. It would be good for food, it'd taste good. And that it was de- a delight to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, lust, pride of life. Pride of life. And, and why is it using the word desire there? This is, that's like an emotion word. Right? Desired to make one wise. This is how I can get there. Desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her passively. I added that part. And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So they immediately start hiding from each other. We need to not be ignorant of the enemy's plans. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Those are the things that he will appeal to that are in us that will help us justify it. And he'll help us justify it by going, oh, it won't be that bad. Nothing bad will happen. God didn't really say that. And um, you know what? He's holding out on you anyway. If he really loved you, he'd let you have whatever you want. And this is where some people think, well, I was born this way. I was born with this desire. You, if you were born with that desire, but that desire is outside the word and will of God, that desire must be submitted and surrendered to the will and word of God. It might be a real desire. It might be a real emotion. But that real emotion is sin. Because guess what? We are all broken people, and every single one of us has areas in our life that are stronger temptations for us, and are more, we have struggled more giving into those things than other things. It's just some of the things that some of us give into are more socially acceptable. And so we think like, oh, that's, like a, that's a respectable sin. I mean, that's common. But that sin, ooh, no, 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 no. Here's the thing, they both have to be submitted to the Word of God. They both have to, because they're both sin. So we need to recognize the schemes of the enemy. Look at what Satan does here. First thing he does in Matthew 4, we're back to Matthew 4. First thing he does in Matthew 4 is he questions Jesus. Since you are, eh. Jesus answers back with Scripture. We'll get to that in a minute. Satan's second play. Okay, well, since you're going to use this whole verse thing, let me use a verse. And Satan takes, he uses two verses in the second temptation. Look at what it says here in verse 6. And he said to him, if you're the Son of God, 
throw yourself down, for it is written. Satan says it back to him, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Only one problem. Satan didn't use all the verses when he quoted that. He left some parts out. Hold your place right here. Turn to Psalm 91. It's not coming up on the screen, all right? Try to have most of them on the screen for you. This one is not. You need to turn there. Check it out. Don't miss this. Come on, y'all. We're having Bible drill this morning. Here we go. Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. This is what Satan misquotes. I'm going to read it from Matthew, then I'll read it from Psalm 91. Let me read it from Matthew to you again while you're turning to Psalm 91. Satan quotes, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands he will, uh, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Well, look at what Psalm 91, 11, and 12 actually says. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. He left that whole part out. And then, verse 12, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. It is not one of God's ways that Jesus throws himself off the top of the, of the temple. Not one of God's ways. So Jesus quotes Scripture back to him. Again, we'll get there in a moment. So Satan will do all kinds of things, but one of the things he will also do is he will twist Scripture, and he will tempt us to twist Scripture so that, you know what, I, I found a loophole. I found a loophole. No. No, you didn't. You're justifying your sin. Luke 17, 1, Jesus says to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. That does not say that God will, he'll never give you something you can't handle. That's dumb. Everything you can't handle. You can't handle anything. God has to help you handle everything, Okay? But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured and enticed by his own desire. Some of you fishermen, you're seeing that word, the lure, right? What's the thing about a lure? It looks good, it looks real, but there's a hook in it. Or treble hooks in it, okay? Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth, to, brings forth death. So God is not the one tempting us with sin. God cannot be tempted with sin. So in some ways, Jesus is tempted here he's tested here but we were never in any harm's way and that's good news that's really good news so we need to be aware of his schemes be aware of, of what he's going to do and how he's going to do it now let's finish fast number four we need to remember and speak the word of god remember and speak the word of god we need to remember and speak the word of god so we need to remember we need to remember who we are we need to recognize when we're weak we need to recognize the wiles of the enemy. Number four, we need to remember and speak the word of God. Jesus' responses are all from the book of Deuteronomy. For it is written, it is written, it is written. When you are tempted, listen, my question to you is, do you have an it is written on your heart and in your mind that you can quote? If you don't, you, you own a Bible. Google is your friend. You need to have a scripture memorized that when you are, whatever, those one or two like sins that you're most tempted with, that you struggle with the most, you need to have some verses in, in your, loaded up in the gun, ready to shoot. Because you are going to be tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin to give in to the temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. We're going to be tempted for the rest of our life. That does not mean you sin. There's nothing to repent of just because you were tempted. But if you give in to sin, that's where you need to, to repent. So Jesus here sets an example for us that when he is tempted, he combats the lie associated with the temptation with truth from God's word. And you can do the same thing. 
You and I, we can do the same thing. But we got to have one loaded up. Some of y'all need to grab you some index cards and one of those little ring thingies, poke a hole in it, write some stuff down, and you need to memorize that sucker. It's not rocket science. Well, I just can't memorize things anymore. Bull. You remember songs from your childhood, and you could go verse, like you got it all. Don't tell me you can't. You just remember what you listen to the most. And so do I. It's not just you. It's me too. Okay? That's what we do. We need to remember and speak the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored up your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Ephesians chapter 6, the last, kind of that middle to last part of verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Word of God there is not logos. It's rhema, spoken Word of God. You need to be the creepy, weird person when you're walking down. Uh, I'm just being honest with you. Be the weird. Just embrace the weird. If you're in the grocery store and you're tempted with something, say it out. Quote that verse out loud. That's when it's the, that's when it's the sword. Quote it out loud. Just embrace the weird. Embrace it, because you need to hear it, and the enemy has to hear it if you say it out loud. Hello? Like the spiritual warfare of this battle? It's real. It's not some made-up thing. It wasn't like some, well, the devil. Well, you know, the devil, it's, it's, he represents, you know, like humanity. And he represents, no, 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 the devil. It's real. Hell is real. Anyone who denies Christ with their life, denies and does not put their faith in Christ, will spend eternity in hell, and they don't get out. Listen, hell is a really long time. Heaven is a really long time. Hell is a really long time. Think about it this way. The people who refused to repent when Noah preached for 120 years, I firmly believe when, when Noah got out of that boat, there were places in the wood where nails had been like they were trying to claw their way in. Those people who died apart from trusting God, they went to hell and they're still there. God doesn't want that for you. That's why he sent his son. God didn't want it for them. That's why he sent Noah to preach to them while the ark was being built for 120 years. Literally no one, literally no one listened. Literally no one. We've got to remember and speak the word of God. Number five, we combat the lies with the truth. And number five, we need to rest in the one who gives us victory. Rest in the one who gives us victory. Because you are not stronger than sin on your own. You're not stronger than your temptation on your own, but you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. Jesus has already won. It's not, he's not just won the battle. The war is over. This is just lingering things until the end comes. These are small battles compared to the war. The war has been won. And we have victory in Christ. Look at what it says here. Let's read verses 10 and 11 from Matthew chapter 4. If uh, then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. Now the other gospels that mention this, they say they left him for a time. We know when he came back. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. We have victory in Jesus. He's greater than our sin, he's stronger than our sin, and he's stronger than our adversary. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, verse 37 says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Revelation 12, 11, and they, talking about the saints who have overcome, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Church, family, you have victory over sin. It would be ridiculous for the United States 
to have victory and then say, you know what? No, you can, you can have it. We, we lose. We would look at that and go, well, no, 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 stop. If the Revolutionary War had gone that way, we get help from other countries. We're grateful for that. We win. And then how dumb would it be for us to go, you know what, Great Britain? Could you just come back? You can have it all. We, we changed our mind. We as believers, we have victory. Walk in that victory. Don't give in to sin. He's a defeated foe. He's done for. He's dead. He's dying. It, he's over. It, all it, it's a matter of time. It's just a matter of when. Matter of when, it's all said and done. But it's, it's done now. He's, he knows the end. He's just trying to steal, kill, and destroy while he can. But he cannot win. You, in Christ, have all the victory. So today, my question to you is this. Follower of Jesus. Follower of Jesus. Are you living in that victory or are you surrendering again to a yoke of slavery? Are you giving in and going, oh, I mean, yeah, I'll win, but like, ah, let me give some victory back. Follower of Jesus, today, is there sin in your life? Because you have surrendered and given in to temptation. When it comes, recognize it. Know where you're weak so you can kind of avoid some of that stuff. Bring some people alongside you. But recognize how the enemy fights. And listen, learn how to fight back. We have victory because of the word of the Lamb, and the blood of the Lamb, and a word of our testimony. The word of God. Fight back with God's word. Some of y'all need to load the revolver with some scripture this week. So that when he comes, he's not going to lie. It's, you, could, you guys remember that? It was, it was a very godly movie. Um, that movie, uh, Major Pain. You remember that movie? If you haven't seen it, I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying I had to, so I'm going to use it. When the little boy is afraid of the monster in his closet, there's no monster in there, young people. There wasn't, okay? And Major Payne, you know, he pulls out his 45 and he's pop, 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 unloads it into the closet. And he looks back at the kid and says, well, he's in there now, he ain't happy. Some of y'all need to, you need to load some scripture this week. So that when temptation comes, you can shoot back and say, yeah, if he's in there now, he ain't happy. Believer, that's us. If you don't know Christ, this is what, this is what I want to tell you today. You, you're just like me. You're just like I was. You thought you knew best, and so you were doing the best you could. But your life is broken, just like mine was. Your life is broken. That Jesus came to give you eternal life. And part, a big way of how he did that, listen, he lived the sinless life that you couldn't live and that I couldn't live. And he, over, he didn't give in to temptation. He lived a sinless life so that he could be the sinless sacrifice. That he could pay for your sin and take the consequences of your sin and for my sin. And anyone who will turn from their sin and put their faith in Christ, he will save. If you're in this room and you have done that in your life, do you agree that that was the best decision you ever made in your entire life? Yeah. Amen? If you're in this room and you've never done that from your seat right now, just call upon him. Lord, I've sinned. And I understand my sin has consequences. But Jesus... I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. And I believe you came back to life just like the Bible says you did. And so right now I turn from my sin and I put my faith in you. It's as simple as that. You know, you could even say it more simply. Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Save me. That simple prayer, God will hear, he will answer, and he will say yes. How will you respond today?